Granville GB R1 racer was rolled out of a hangar at the Cleveland Air Races for the qualifying runs of the Thompson Trophy. Attempting to control the 800 horsepower monster around the Thompson course would be Jimmy Doolittle, whose own Laird Super Solution biplane was out of action with landing gear problems. The high speed is expected to be in the vicinity of 300 miles an hour. The landing speed about 90. In spite of the high speed range and the high speed of the plane, it handles very well in the air and on the ground. The paragraphs have been installed and uh, in the next few minutes we expect to make an attempt on the world speed record. There was a bonus prize of $1,575 for the fastest Thompson qualifier. Doolittle didn't disappoint the big Cleveland crowd. His qualifying speed of 294.38 miles an hour smashed the world land plane speed record that stood since 1924. There was another GB entered in the Thompson Trophy race in 1932. It was the GB R2, almost identical with the R1 in appearance, but fitted with a Pratt & Whitney Wasp Jr delivering about 250 horsepower less than the R1's 800. This is a replica of the GBR2, exactly as it appeared when Lee Gelbach flew it at Cleveland in 1932. The replica, built by Delmar Benjamin of Wyoming, flew for the first time in late 1991, just under 60 years later. The big GBs made their racing debut in 1931, and from the beginning, their performance was startling. Clear. Lowell Bales won the 1931 Thompson Trophy in a GB Model Z, but was killed when it crashed while he was trying to set a new land plane speed record. In flying his replica GBR2, Delmar Benjamin is aware of its reputation as one of the most dangerous airplanes ever built. But it's also one of the most exhilarating to fly, as Delmar discovered when he took off for the first time on December 23, 1991. At first flight, Delmar established that in spite of its ungainly appearance, the GB will do surprising things. But at Cleveland in 1932, Jimmy Doolittle and Lee Gelbach weren't interested in the GB's aerobatic qualities. They were looking for pure speed around the Thompson Trophy course. planes were sent off at 10 second intervals, and there was never any doubt about the outcome. Doolittle and the GBR1 lapped everybody in the field except Jimmy Waddell. back in the R2 came in fifth, averaging 30 miles an hour less than Doolittle's winning 252 miles an hour. Doolittle marked his victory with a low pass at full throttle across the finish line. The prize for the winner was $4,500, which
With the $1,500 he picked up as fastest qualifier, he made $6,000 in two days. Quite a sum in Depression America. Jimmy Doolittle was presented with the winner's wreath and was joined by the race sponsor, Charles E. Thompson, and his wife. How about the sponsor of the Thompson Trophy saying hello to the world? Oh, wait a while. Wait a while. All right, hurry up. <laughs> Say hello to him. Jimmy, will you please? Just hold the world hello. Say him, tell him again. Investigators try to get communities to step <laughs> The Granville entourage made out well at the 1931 National Air Races. The Model Z won five races in all. Meanwhile, Bob Hall finished fourth in the Thompson Trophy race in the Model Y. Maud Tate set a new ladies' speed record in the Model Y by winning the Aerol Trophy, the premier event for women pilots. Another grand The weather was raw, and the air extremely turbulent the afternoon of December 5th, as Bales set up for his record speed runs. Adding to his discomfort was the dangerously outdated regulation, limiting speed runs to below 50 meters, 164 feet. Acceptable perhaps for earlier times, but not for the faster aircraft of the day. Quite nearly, he was just approaching the, the marker when she seemed to explode, and uh, Bales, were, it, uh, a wing collapsed, and the, it made four complete they, they, they had a movie camera set up at that pylon and they had taken beautiful pictures of it they had absolutely clear pictures of it and, and granny run those pictures over and over and over trying to find out what the cause was Crowd watching granny the real Giro. show today starting with jimmy doolittle the human bullet a new record 293 miles an hour And Jimmy set a new world land plane speed record in the shell speed dash at 296 miles per hour, more than 10 miles per hour faster than his closest challenger. His win brought the title back to America from France, which had held the record for the past eight years. Winning the shell speed dash earned Doolittle the tidy sum of $1,575. He also won the Lowell Bales Memorial Trophy, sponsored by the citizens of Springfield and awarded to flyers setting a new American land plane speed record. Now, it was on to the main event, the race for the Thompson Trophy. 
the big GBs waited at the starting line. Bob Hall and uh, the two with two or three Waddell Williams ships were the real competition, and they were all up in about close to same speeds. There was really some tight competition with everything except Doolittle. Doolittle had a lot enough more speed over everybody, so that he flew high, wide, and handsome. Gelbach finished fifth in the R2 and pocketed another five hundred dollars. Jimmy Doolittle's double measure of success brought fame and glory once again to Springfield and the GB name. Unbeknownst at the time, this was to be Doolittle's last race. He intended to retire. This series of shots dramatically shows the stability that was built into these classic airplanes. Because of conflicting runway traffic, Doolittle is shown in the R1 aborting a landing attempt. While at low air speed and altitude, he executes a tricky go around with ease. Extensive wind tunnel testing had proved that the aircraft was completely stable at all speeds attributed to the design engineering that went into these magnificent machines. Doolittle heaped praise on the GB and Granville Brothers aircraft, summing up his personal feelings in a note mailed to Zanford on September 7th, just a few days after the national air races. Dear Granny, just a note to tell you that the big GB functioned perfectly in both the Thompson Trophy and the Shell Speed Dash. With sincere best wishes for your continued success, I am as forever, Jim. And so the high point of the 1932 aviation year came to a close with the GBs pushing their country to the forefront of world aviation. It also closed a chapter in the GB story, but never again would these beautiful aircraft grace the skies without being hounded by ill fortune and a series of unfortunate accidents caused by pilot error or lack of experience in high performance aircraft. The death knell came in 1934, when Zanford, delivering a sportster to a client in the South, was landing at Spartansburg, South Carolina. Granny crashed and was killed as he pulled up suddenly to avoid hitting an airport workman who had wandered into his path on the runway. That accident sealed the fate of Granville Brothers aircraft and also signaled the end of a glorious period in American aviation history. Most of the players in the GB story are gone. The Springfield Airport is no longer, replaced by a shopping center. And yet, around the world, the presence of the GBs lives. In the commercial world, the engineering genius and innovative daring of the GBs is an integral fabric of the aircraft of today. One of the best times of my life, I'll tell you because it was really gratifying to be able to do what I wanted to do, was design airplanes. And I had no interference. And uh, Granny was a great leader. And uh, 